So good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's August 19th meeting. I'm John Jeffries, the chair. Bob Springett is present. Bob, I would ask you to say to, to say here and present so everybody can recognize you. And also here I am. Robin will be along shortly. We have town administrator Chris, Chris Dwelly is with us, assistant Kate O'Brien. We have Dave Sullivan. This evening, the meeting is being conducted via Zoom. Please be careful not to share your screen. Please note that this evening meeting is being recorded via Facebook and will be available for general consumption to the public. Um, we are, in fact, continuing the process of last year through, Governor's Baker, through Governor Baker's extension of the order. This evening, we have a full agenda. We've got a lot of items to cover. The most, um, the, the item that we're going to cover first has probably got the attention of most of the people on the screen. Uh, typically, in the start of the meeting, we ask for citizens' comments. We have received seven citizens' comments with regards to Colonial Water, which is our first item of business this evening. So um, I, I'm going to take those items and those questions after we hear from both Denise Garlick, our representative, Kristen Devers. Uh, Kristen, did I pronounce your name correctly? Devers? All right, John, it's, it's Kristen Divers. Very phonetic, Divers. just like it's spelled. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So after Kristen and after Colonial, we're going to allow, we're going to take these questions. Um, either myself, Chris, or Kate will read the questions. Um, we feel for the sake of being responsive to the citizens, for the sake of, of keeping the meeting moving along, and we don't want to have duplication of questions uh, for the folks who have joined this, e this evening. We're gonna handle it that way. Before I introduce uh, the other board members, I'd like to frame for you this, the first topic and the first conversation that we're gonna have this evening re regarding our citizens and the colonial water issue. The board, um, I'm gonna give a very brief framing of the board's position. I'll then ask both Bob and Robin uh, to add any comments that they would like to add. From the chair's perspective and the board's perspective, we would like simply to state to everybody who's viewing this evening and those at home that we, the Board of Selectmen, recognize the community element of this issue. We, at the very onset of the issue we had last year, the issue that we've had this year, the board has done everything that it can do to first and foremost, to investigate the issue, to attach the proper resources from the town to the issue, and then to do due diligence that we've done on our own. Personally, um, as I said, I'm gonna let Bob and, and Robin share their thoughts, but personally, I made several phone calls to neighboring, to neighbors in the affected areas and affected homes to make sure that first and foremost, this wasn't an idiosyncratic event and that it was an event that it, uh, impacted more than just one or two homes. Um, we want you to know that everything that we've done with regards to colonial water or to any water issue, we are going to do our utmost to be responsive to both the providers, to people impacted, and to call upon any of the resources that we have, such as Denise and the DEP. Um, we are going to frame this both in a short-term fix and we're going to also segue into long-term solutions. We're not gonna get bogged down into inflammatory rhetoric. We're not gonna get bogged down into what expectations are immediately or should have been. We're going to address this in, as we've done in any other situation, a very professional and thoughtful manner. So from the standpoint of the board, we just want you to know that we have taken this matter very seriously from the minute it was brought to our attention as we have any other issue in the past. With respect to Colonial Water, we will hear from them. Uh, we do want everyone to know that with regards to Colonial Water, they have been responsive and have 
done their best to guarantee to us that they're acting within the limits that have been established by bodies like the DEP and our state agencies. We will, as I said, segue this into a larger, broader topic. At the moment, I'm gonna ask Bob Springett if he would like to make any comments prior to introducing Denise. Uh, thank you, John. Um, this issue um, was raised to my attention when I saw a copy of an email that Ed Chu uh, sent to the town administrator uh, outlining the problems with discoloration in water. I don't know if it's back in July. Um, and um, speaking with our town administrator, um, we, we ultimately set up a meeting with Ed at his home to visit and to take a look at things firsthand. Um, I, then uh, from our, our point of view, um, the town administrator had done this earlier. He had uh, contacted Representative Garlic's office Representative Garlic, working within the, the framework of the, of the state government, contacted the DEP. Um, and this is exactly the same process that we took uh, back, I guess, a year ago now when the issue of E. coli um, first resurrected, it's first appeared on the Francis Street uh, well. Um, I will also take this time right now to thank uh, all those involved in trying to resolve this problem. There's been a lot of work done by a lot of people. Um, and it's unfortunate that we haven't come to a uh, better resolution, but it's not for lack of trying. Um, I echo John's thoughts about uh, let's focus on the issue. Let's focus on what's been done in terms of um, moving the, the issues, moving between the DEP and cloned water. Um, and let's make sure that we are forward focused and positive. Um, as always, my, my gratitude to Representative Garlic, uh, State Representative and our State Senator, staff, and all the help that they've given this town in trying to make sure that the um, water quality in town is A+. plus. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Bob. Robin, um, would you like to add some comments before we begin? Uh, no, I won't. I don't. I'll add comments during the conversation. Thank you very, very much. So this time I'd like to introduce you to Denise Garlic, our state representative. Denise, as both I mentioned earlier, Bob mentioned, um, has been extremely helpful to the town of Dover uh, with her being the, the point person that we've reached out to at the state for the introductions to the DEP. And uh, Denise, would you, share your thoughts with us and give us a brief overview of, of what your office has done. Yes, of course. So first of all, I wanna say good evening to you, John, and to Robin and to Bob, and to welcome the DEP, my state colleagues onto the call. Um, I know that Senator Rush's staff is also on this call. And I wanna say hello to the Colonial Water staff. Um, I guess I can sum up everything in the statement from the letter from DEP that says to us very clearly that Colonial Water um, Company is technically deficient, right? And we are all struggling with what that means and what the impact of that is. Um, in this meeting, I want very much to hear about the corrective actions that were due to be taken by July 30th, a deadline that we have passed and to hear that the professional engineering consultant has been hired, which was due by August 16th of 2021. Um, the short term, just like John is trying to frame this meeting for me, um, I actually term this in terms of short term urgent needs and a long term urgent need, right? The short term urgent need is that we need to be have consistent communication that there is no bacterial contamination in the water. We keep talking about the water being safe. Um, I want to ensure on a consistent basis that that is true and to have a plan for that. Historically, this time last summer, we did not have water that was free of bacterial contamination. That anecdotally was preceded by discolored water. The second is I expect that the Dover Colonial Water should supply the Dover residents with clear, safe drinking water, that discolored water 
no matter how you look at it, is unpalatable to the people that are trying to pour it out of their faucet or offering it to a guest in their house, as Ed Chu did. It is also staining clothes, sinks, tubs, that issue. This should not be acceptable to us, and we need to have a plan for that. But most importantly, we need the Dover residents of the Colonial Water Company to be supplied safe, clear drinking water with a plan from Colonial Water. And then the long-term urgent need, and it is still an urgent need, although I realize it might take a little bit more time, is we need an innovative plan for flushing the system. Over and over in the documents, we see that flushing the system is the answer. We see why there are barriers to that. We need to come up with a plan so that the system can be flushed. And finally, I would say that um, I also want to be sure that as we finish this call tonight, that we are very clear that we have a plan to hold accountable the professional engineer consultant that is supposed to be hired by Colonial Water and that DEP will vigilantly monitor those actions. So I look forward to listening and learning always and I stay committed on this issue. I can think of um, almost no other issue as vital to a family's health as clean, clear drinking water. Thank you. I'd just like to add one thing that I uh, we've added in the past in all of the water issues. So please take note of this. Myself, Robin, and Bob are all Colonial Water customers. So this is a matter that not only we take very personally and professionally in our duties to the town but we are in fact Colonial Water customers. So we are addressing this issue both as customers and as the executives in the town of Dover. So I just wanted to remind those of you at home that we do see this from both sides. Um, at, this, at this time, I would like to introduce Kristen, um, Kristen with MassDEP. And Kristen, would you take a minute to introduce yourself and your team and frame your team's response uh, as up to tonight? Sure, um, good evening, everyone. Before I do start, John, I just wanna introduce Eric Worrell. He is the regional director for Northeast Regional Office of MassDEP, who's actually my boss. So <laughs> it's more like I'm his team and others, um, but I'd like to, introduce him first. I think he has some words before I go into a, um, a little bit more detail. Okay, thank you, Kristen. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as uh, Kristen said, I'm Eric Worrell. I'm the Regional Director of MassDEP's Northeast Region. Uh, we all met around this time last year when we had the bacteria issue in the Francis Street Wells. Um, and I would say, you know, one of the first things that Representative Garlic made very clear when we met for this most recent issue is she wanted to ensure that the water was safe for people to drink. That was uh, very clear guide guidance that she gave us and uh, very well thought guidance. And so one of the first things that we did immediately is we required Colonial Water to take a full suite of samples for all contaminants that would present an acute health risk. So things that would actually be a public health risk. And uh, I'm happy to report that all of those samples were negative, so they were all clean. So immediately back in June, we ruled out that there was any type of immediate public health threat. Um, I would also add that after last year's bacteria incident at the Francis Street Wells, we also required Colonial Water to install what's known as four log treatment, which essentially means that even if bacteria was present in the wells themselves, it would be chlorinated to such a degree that it would be, it would inactivate any bacteria before it went out in the distribution system to the first user. So that was the big takeaway that we uh, required Colonial Water to install last year. Um, with the more recent um, incident with the discoloration issues, uh, we've been working very closely with Colonial Water, uh, Representative Garlic, Senator Rush and town officials on trying to put together a comprehensive plan that hopefully will uh, fix the issue permanently once and for all. And so we required Colonial Water Company to submit a corrective action plan. There were some deficiencies associated with that. I believe everyone received a copy of the letter with the additional requirements that we imposed on Colonial Water. 
Um, Kristen will go into more detail in a moment on each of those specific action items and what the current status is, but I can tell you that as of today, Colonial Water has complied with every single deliverable that's been required in our approved corrective action plan. Um, and there are some additional actions that we'll be taking within the next week to week and a half um, that I will let Colonial speak to in terms of the specific timing, um, but with real, uh, they will be doing some well cleaning at wells A, B, and C at the Francis Street wells as well, uh, which may help to resolve some of the discoloration issues as well. And then in the longer term, um, they, we require them to hire an independent third party engineer to do a comprehensive assessment of the entire system, the hydraulics of the system, whether chemi additional chemical addition may make sense, uh, whether water storage may make sense so they could keep pressure at a sufficient level so they could do more aggressive flushing, which they can't do right now. Um, and potentially even up to including evaluation of filtration treatment for the wells themselves. So um, I will turn it over to Kristen to walk everyone through the document that we issued and what the status of each of those deliverables are. And obviously we're here to hopefully answer any questions that you may have and uh, very much appreciate uh, the close coordination with both Colonial Water, uh, the town and the state legislative delegation on this issue. So Kristen. Eric, that was a, that was a really great overview. Um, I was prepared to give a little bit more of that. So I did want to let everyone know that, you know, since MassDEP has been aware of this issue, and this was in late June, we have required specific steps to be taken by Colonial Water Company. Well, I'm just going to call CWC because it's a little bit quicker. Um, and that's been to both respond to and ascertain the cause of the discoloration. We've also conducted a site inspection at the um, Colonial Water Company distribution system, and we have required the increased water quality monitoring that Eric mentioned. Um, specifically, DEP required additional monitoring of all those regulated or primary acute contaminants. And those are the the contaminants that Eric mentioned are considered to have the immediate health impacts. So those primary contaminants have all established maximum contaminant levels or what we call MCLs. And then in addition to those acute contaminants, DEP also required monitoring of what are known as secondary contaminants or those that are generally considered to cause aesthetic and cosmetic issues such as odor and discoloration. So as Eric said, you know, once DEP confirmed that there was no initial acute contamination present, then we required Colonial Water Company to develop and submit a corrective action plan that identifies both corrective actions being immediately taken, as well as other short-term and long-term plans to resolve the overall discoloration issue. And I think it's very important to point out that there are various elements to corrective action plans or what we call caps, depending on the particular situation. And in this case, DEP was evaluating overall water quality, water demand, chemical treatment, distribution flow and hydraulics, and water storage. So while there were some deficiencies that we identified um, in the submitted cap from CWC, they were addressed in a revised cap that they submitted on July 30th. This included retaining the services of those independent third parties that Representative Garlic, you mentioned, um, and that specified third party inspection of the wells, as well as hiring of a Massachusetts registered professional engineer to provide a complete comprehensive system evaluation and assessment to determine the cause of the discoloration. So the deadline to retain those third party services was July 30th and August 16th respectively for the, for the well inspection and the assessment. Um, and that remained in line with our original deadlines that were established in the initial cap. So at this point, CWC has submitted their well inspection reports to MassDEP and they have established a schedule, as Eric mentioned, for both well cleaning and redevelopment of two wells, as well as a preliminary schedule for the full system evaluation and assessment. 
And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about some of the corrective actions for immediate and long-term implementation that we required that were part of the deficiencies. Um, we really, DEP wanted to identify the times when demand is typically lowest in order to continue flushing of the system. Uh, we wanted information about the bleeders that are installed on the system. And that incl includes, I don't know if everybody probably doesn't know what a bleeder is, um, but it's basically a line that is running water so that water isn't stagnant inside the pipe and it allows water movement um, and less discoloration to occur. And then especially in the areas where there were some more higher concentrations of complaints of discoloration. Um, we wanted information about the frequent messaging that Colonial Water Company was establishing with its customers and how they were doing so. Um, there was also a request to install a temporary polyphosphate injection system for the Francis Street Wells based on uh, some new, new data that Colonial Water Company had on manganese levels at the Francis Street Wells. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that later. I'm sure there will be questions. Um, and then there was the extension request for the, um, to engage the engineering company, um, which we did not provide. That was in line with the original deadline that we set. So, Again, I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions, but I think I would like to turn it over to Colonial Water Company to elaborate on the specific actions that they've been taking and what they have planned with the schedule so far for the well redevelopment, well cleaning, and um, the full evaluation and assessment. Sure, thank you, Kristen. Um, I'm Bob Gallo uh, from Colonial Water Company. This is uh, Nicola Chance, and uh, I think I think Eric and, and Kristen did a really good job of summarizing what, uh, what's what been going on and, and what we've done thus far. Uh, but to bring you up to date about on what we are doing uh, in the near term, uh, you know, Kristen and Eric both mentioned the well inspections that we had done. And uh, the results of those inspections indicated that well be uh, needed the screen cleaned, um, not, uh, not due to encrustation, but just due to, um, you know, there being some deposits on there that, that needed to be cleaned. Uh, that well itself was redeveloped last year uh, after the boiler. That was uh, just kind of a maintenance item that we tackled. Uh, and, then, um, and then the redevelopment really is, uh, you know, not only cleaning of the well, uh, but it's, 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 uh, it's an action that you know reestablishes, uh, I guess, um, what you would call openings in in the gravel pack, and what it does is it helps to clean that out, uh, helps to improve the production of the well, um, which is primarily what you typically do it for. Uh, but that was done last year. Uh, as part of the current inspections, the inspections we just had done, uh, which included uh, you know, camera inspection of the wells. Uh, the company that did the inspections recommended that we also redevelop wells A and C, uh, which we are, are go going to be doing. Um, to be more specific, uh, what we're going to do is start with well B, uh, which just requires the cleaning. And that's going to be done on Monday or Tuesday of next week, weather permitting. So as I understand, there is uh, some, uh, some wet weather moving in. Uh, upon finishing that, completing the, the cleaning, uh, we're then going to move on to the redevelopment of well C, uh, which, will, um, which will prepare us for the redevelopment of well A. Well A is our largest uh, producer out there at the well field, so we want to be sure that wells uh, B and C are uh, in, in good shape to, uh, to provide uh, provide the water uh, during the redevelopment of well A because it does take several days to redevelop a well. Um, it can uh, sometimes take up to a week uh, depending on, on the condition of the well and, and how it goes. Um, so I think at that time, you know, I would say just, you know, just to bring it up right away um, is that we will need some cooperation from the community uh, in, um, reducing uh, some of the you know, high demands that are put on the system at this time of year. 
uh, particularly um, during uh, evening hours when there's you know a high degree of irrigation uh, during the warm weather. We're in that season now uh, because we are going to be running on wells B and C. Again, well A being our largest producer will be offline for several days. Um, so that's something that we'll be looking uh, you know, to coordinate with the town and hopefully get some messaging out uh, you know, about how we can uh, keep the demands down while we're doing this work. Uh, also, um, as, as uh, Kristen mentioned, we did hire a third party consultant uh, to evaluate the system, uh, several components of the system. Uh, there's gonna be a, a study of the water quality um, you know, and potential causes of the discoloration. Uh, there will be uh, hydraulic analysis of the system uh, to determine what kind of, uh, really what kind of flushing capacity and velocities we have in the system. And, you know, it will also test what these high demand periods may do to the system as well uh, in regards to pressure drops and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the other um, goals of the study is going to be an evaluation of storage needs, if there is uh, if there is uh, a need for that. Um, so that'll be, I guess, the third prong of the study. Uh, in regards to the water quality, uh, what we've done is, uh, you know, the, our consultant gave us a timeline, kind of a horizon of when they could have all the work done. But in an effort to, uh, in an effort to uh, reduce the timeline on the water quality, we've we've spoken to them, and they're going to look at that first. Um, you know, we're, they're going to look at that first and, and, you know, upon us giving them the information they need, which they've provided a list for us, uh, they're going to get to work on that. And within, you know, three weeks, uh, they, they intend to produce a report, um, intend to produce a report that will outline you know, what steps should be taken to, to remedy the issue. Um, so I just just to mention, uh, you know, wells A, B, and C that we did talk about are all located at Francis Street, uh, which is our uh, our main facility where uh, we provide you know most of the water uh, to the town. Uh, so you know, um, as far as you know, previous actions, what we've done, you know, we we have been. Um, we have been testing uh, more often for manganese and, and iron. Uh, and, you know, we continue to have, as, as Kristen pointed out, those bleeders around town to try and keep the water moving. Uh, we periodically flush our wells uh, to, uh, you know, help clear out anything that may be in there. Um, so, so we are taking some, I guess, ongoing, continuous and ongoing um, steps uh, towards, you know, hopefully resolving this problem in the near future. Great, um, Bob, thank you very much. At this point in time in, in this discussion, what I would like to do is bring in Chris Dwelly and specifically for the purpose of- No, let's bring down. Uh, please mute yourself, Eddie, not mute your computer. Um, specifically, what I'd like Chris to bring together are Bob's comments, as Bob was wrapping up his, his comments, he alluded to the consultant's report. He alluded to the list that the consultant will give to Colonial Water. I would like to hear, every, I would like everyone to hear from Chris, Chris Dwelly, our town administrator, because Chris and his office have been diligent in addressing every issue that has been brought by anyone affected by tying in these various agencies that are with us this evening. And we, the Board of Selectmen, so have many of the items that we've been in our long-term planning. And I just would like to, again, Kate, can you identify who's not muted and ask them to mute or just drop them from the call? I'm not going to repeat myself. Mute your computer. Um, Thank you. Chris, would you just uh, bring that together and let the folks on the call know where your office is? Uh, sure, John. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I think as you know, you and the other board members, as well as 
our legislative delegation and the DEP and Colonial have indicated this evening that, you know, we've worked closely on behalf of uh, the community um, to get uh, toward a resolution uh, on this issue and to bring the community together as an opportunity for us to uh, hear from the water provider as well as the regulatory agency um, to have a forum here so that the community can hear um, what steps are being taken and uh, when they can expect uh, clear and predictable and, uh, and safe water. And if it's all right with you, Mr. Chairman, I know that we've got a, a Q&A session um, targeted here this evening. We've received about eight questions from residents um, and uh, perhaps um, if it's all right with you, I, I could leave that lead that off because you know there are two questions in particular that I have uh, for the water company as it relates to uh, the impact on the community. Perfect, perfect segue. Go right ahead. Thank you, Chris. Um, so first off, and again, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Colonial uh, Bob and Nick, for being here uh, with us this evening. Um, indicated or discussed this evening, uh, this has been, the discoloration issue has been one uh, that is two months uh, now. And I appreciate uh, that there is a corrective action plan in place and a plan to bring uh, some professional engineers in uh, to look at what the cause of the issue could be. Um, but my concern here is that being two months in, how long, how much longer is it going to take before the community can expect to see clear water running through their taps. Uh, what my concern is, uh, and this is certainly echoed by the board and others on this call, is that we don't wanna get ourselves in a, you know, in, a, in a situation where we're just getting reports and follow-ups with additional items, right? I think what the community wants to hear this evening is uh, what's a concrete time frame, right? For when we can expect these implementation actions to take place and when we can turn our faucets on and see clear water running through them. So that's my, my first question, if I could just have Colonial respond and speak to that. Uh, sure, Chris. Uh, well, you know, as we discussed, you know, we have hired a consultant, a consultant to look at this, and they're gonna study all of our water quality, um, our water, water quality testing from, I believe it's the past five years, and uh, more importantly, the most recent, uh, water quality uh, data. Um, there is a timeline of three weeks uh, for them uh, once we get them their, their data, which will be, uh, you know, we'll probably have most of it out to them tomorrow, uh, if not um, by, uh, by Monday. And um, so that's a three week timeline. And once they come up with, uh, you know, a determination of what needs to be done, if it is, you know, uh, you know, uh, Kristen mentioned earlier, you know, a polyphosphate, uh, you know, addition to the water, that, that could be a possibility that they come up with and, um, and suggest. And if that were the case, uh, there would be some permitting involved with that. Uh, so, you know, I would, I would anticipate, you know, it taking probably several more weeks after that, uh, you know, if there's an expedited uh, design and review of the project. Uh, so, so we are looking at, you know, best case scenario, I think, if we're waiting for a consultant, um, the permitting, I mean, it, it could be, uh, you know, in the realm of, of six weeks. That being said, um, we may see some relief if there is, uh, you know, if cooler weather arrives and we do see a re reduction in irrigation and you know overall demand on this system because that that very well could have uh, you know be a contributor to the problem um, you know when you do have you know very high demands you often and and pressure fluctuations that that also come with those demands uh, you can sometimes have you know a lot of uh, sediment in the sort um, disturbed in, within the pipeline so. Um, so if we do see, you know, as I said, the cooler weather arrive and, and the demand decrease, you know, you may uh, see a reduction in the discoloration even without uh, any treatment. So, uh, but again, it's going to, it's not, it's not going to be uh, in, in two weeks that we'll be able to, you know, from a, 
uh, from a study and treatment perspective, be able to solve the problem. You know, uh, you know, any short term um, improvements that you see would really be related to, um, you know, the demand and use of the system. Well, thanks, Bob. I appreciate um, your thoughts on on the length of time, um, and uh, and I understand that uh, you know an evaluation and implementation of these steps um, doesn't happen overnight. Um, but we still have folks living with uh, discolored water, so that leaves me to my second question. If we're looking anywhere from you know two to six weeks, and we still have people. Uh, residents experiencing water discoloration. The town buildings, as I walked out the door today, were experiencing water discoloration. Uh, and this is a two-part question. The, the first is, uh, what resources can the water company provide to the community so that they have water so that they can wash their clothes, right? Or wash their vegetables or, or have drinking water. And I understand that there's levels of contaminants that are that are safe but I mean the water the water is brown right I mean it's the same color as if I would have just put a glass in the Charles River and take it out um, so you know I'd like to know what opportunities exist there I know that you know Colonial uh, supported the community last year during the boil water order uh, with potable water uh, both a water tanker where people could come and fill up gallon jugs and, and other containers uh, as well as bottled water um, and then that's my first part. And then the second part of, of, of my final question here is um, I've heard flushing a lot and I just wonder, is there no way for tanker trucks to be brought into the community tied up to hydrants to add additional water and water flow to the system so that Colonial could flush the system um, with limited disruption to uh, to the demand on the system that might occur, right? Why couldn't something like that be done from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. where there's lower demand on the system, you've got additional water, you can flush it and then resolve the issue while we look at some of these other longer term implementation steps. So, thanks. Okay. Um, just in regards to the flushing, Chris, that, that is something that we were uh, we were considering um, early on. Uh, one of the challenges with that is the the amount of water that's required for flushing. You know the flow rates um, that are required for flushing. You know if we're looking at um, you know if, if we're looking at flushing an eight inch main and getting good cleansing velocity, and we could we could be talking about six hundred gallons per minute, uh, which I mean, obviously. Um, you know, on a sustained basis, you do that in order to, to flush the main. So, um, so when you look at the, the, the size of uh, your typical uh, tank truck, like for instance, what we had last year down at the town, uh, the town facility uh, for people to, to fill up their, their jugs, I believe that was a 6,000 gallon tanker. Uh, so you can see if you're getting a flu and, and you would have to also bring in um, you know, skid pumps that could provide that kind of flow rate because, you know, because we can't pump that from our wells. Uh, but, you know, we, looking at those flow rates, as you can see, you know, you would consume a lot of water very quickly, uh, which, um, which I don't think you can replenish on a continuous basis. You know, if you're, if you're flushing for 10 minutes, you know, a 6,000 gallon tanker, you know, you can do the math that, that there isn't going to be much time there uh, you know, to uh, do the flushing. So, you know, so that is something we've, we've considered. Uh, we just, uh, you know, thought that it would be um, a difficult thing to do, uh, you know, given, you know, the amount of water it does take. So, uh, and with that, you know, Nick, I think you wanted to address the other point. Yeah. So Chris, just to address your, your first part of your question, which was, um, um, talking about the uh, resources that the company would be able, or could uh, potentially provide uh, to the town. Um, so you mentioned last year where we had uh, brought in the, the tanker truck as well as handing out bottled water um, in which we did so for, uh, for a period of uh, a couple of weeks. Um, you know, as, as we recall last year, um, 
similar situation, but yet different where we had a, uh, we, we had a health concern. We had, we had, a, we had a significant health issue on our hands um, because of the, the contamination of bacteria uh, in the water. Um, and which is uh, the reason why we went forward and, and provided uh, the portable water uh, as we did. Um, at this point in time, uh, we, we have not made the decision to do so here. However, it is under consideration and being evaluated. Uh, I can certainly um, understand and hear uh, your thoughts and, and uh, what you would like to see uh, from a resource standpoint that the company could provide. So um, let, it, let, us take that, let, it, let us take that question. Let us take that consideration of what the company can possibly do from a resource standpoint. Uh, and let us, uh, let us discuss that here. And uh, I can get back to you uh, relatively quickly uh, with what our discussion is on that, Chris. Great, Nick, thank you. Um, we're gonna get to the qu questions before we get to the questions because a couple of these are related there's questions for Denise, there's questions for Colonial, there's questions for the, for the, for the DEP. Um, I just want to uh, go back to my uh, board members, Bob and Robin, and ask them if they would like any specific clarifications on anything that they have heard thus far. Robin? No, I'm actually in listening mode tonight. So okay. yeah, it's... it's it's interesting to Bob? hear everybody's position. I, I uh, there was just one one com one comment is consistently made um, that I think I would like to challenge a little bit, um, and that that comment is that part of the problem is over irrigation in the summertime in the trap, um, and a very wise man counseled me to suggest that we have particularly shallow wells on Francis Street and on Draper, ranging from, I don't know, sort of 40 to 40 or sort of feet. And that July was the wettest month, um, that we had the wettest July ever uh, this past month, three times the average. Um, and it would be hard for me to believe that we had people watering their lawns in the wettest July on record. Uh, is it possible, and have you looked at the, the issue of runoff caused by heavy rains when you have shallow wells? Because certainly, given the, the change in climate, we have, we have experienced a great deal of heavy rains. And with shallow wells, would that mean kind of the, the, the groundwater sort of doesn't settle, it just runs into the wells, and that's causing part of the discoloration. Um, and again, I, I just raise it as so what you're saying about drought and some of we're experiencing in 2021, it seems to be on opposite sides of the, of the uh, dividing line. That's it from the region. Great, thank you, Bob. So we're gonna go through the questions that were, were presented to us and we have, we've addressed, uh, Chris has addressed uh, one of the questions in part of a second, but we're, we're just gonna, go through the specifics of the question. As I said earlier, I know many, many people are upset. You've, you've, uh, you've voiced that quite literally to us. You've put it in writing. I'm going to, in, the, in an effort to try to be as, as um, politically correct in this business, uh, take a business approach and to, to not get, get into any inflammatory rhetoric, I'm going to stick to the essence of the question the first question will be for the Mass DEP specifically, why has Colonial Water not been fined by the Mass DEP and forced to provide clean bottled water to the residents affected? Eric, would you like to take that? Or uh, sure. Kristen, would either of you like to take that? Yeah, I'd be happy to take that question, John. Um, and I believe this question was asked and answered before by the department in writing. Um, I will say that uh, Colonial has been very responsive to the requirements that we've imposed upon them to try to resolve this issue. And I know people don't like to hear this, but um, they are not in violation of the drinking water regulations. It's a secondary standard, not a primary standard. 
So we can only enforce regulations that people violate. So I get it. It's a very unfortunate issue. It's unsettling for folks. They're frustrated. They would like to see this resolved as quickly as possible, as would we and everyone on this call today. Um, but we can only enforce laws that people violate. So that's the answer. Thank you. Denise, this is a question for you with regards to the issue. Uh, specifically, the, the question pertains to $75,000 for emergency water use you, uh, issues in Dover passed by the Mass State, passed through the Mass State budget. The person writing would like to know, would like to understand two things. Why are it, why is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts using taxpayer dollars to fund uh, expenses, specifically emergency water issues in the town of Dover, using the seventy-five thousand dollars and not passing that cost along to Colonial Water? So, thank you, John, and thank you for the question. Um, and I believe that I have a call scheduled with the person who's asked this call, this question tomorrow morning. And um, if in any way this answer is not sufficient, um, I know that people want to deal with the urgent issue of what is happening with the water in Dover right now. But I actually need to set the table and take a few minutes to tell you that my work on the water issue in Dover has transcended more than several years, more than the crisis this year, more than the crisis last year with the contaminated water, and in fact goes back to the Water Resource Committee in Dover, a group of dedicated volunteers who have been talking and discussing the issue around water in Dover for at least five years that I'm sure of, and much longer than that. My staff attends every single meeting of that Water Resource Committee. I represent Needham, all of Needham, all of Dover and half of Medfield. I have also been for more than four years speaking to the people in Dover who are concerned about the water issue, about the impending development of the Medfield State Hospital property, which is going to be at least hundreds, according to the two proposals we see by, by Medfield today, hundreds of housing units. Somewhere between the Charles River watershed and Dover is the Medfield State Hospital property. So I have been deeply concerned about this issue, as well as from the time I was first elected, um, hearing that every time, and this is anecdotal, but each time um, a property dug a well in Dover, there seemed to be a need to dig it deeper and deeper. So I have been concerned about this issue long before we had to deal with the two issues of crisis in the last two summers. The $75,000 is um, something of which I am very proud of, worked very hard to deliver for the town of Dover, but was not precipitated by this issue. It was in fact part of a long range plan of trying to get information to Dover that would be helpful to the town of Dover. We had done some preliminary work with $30,000 several years ago on better data collection for small um, water companies. And now you, you may know, or I hope you do know, when we talk about the town working on the issue related to water, um, the town staff that's involved, the town volunteers, this work has been ongoing. And the town, in fact, had objectives for FY22 related to the water. And it's to implement the second phase, the first phase we've already worked with of the Kleinfelder Water Quality Study, which is a hydrology study that actually talked about data collection at all monitoring wells. The second part of the town's objective was to investigate potential implementation of water conservation regulations and an irrigation system registration. Um, and the third part was to obtain a consulting services ourselves as the town to assist and guide the town of Dover in understanding all of its short and long-term options. The, I, I know that we want to direct our energy tonight to the very urgent issue of having clean, clear um, water for the residents of Dover's colonial water system. But I will tell you from all of the work that I have done, from my interactions with DEP, with my many interactions with the constituents, Dover has uh, a need to address its water issues 
certainly with the Colonial Water Company and beyond the Colonial Water Company. And the work that we must do in setting the table to understand that, to have the data that we need, to have professional advice on how to move forward, not just in time of crisis, but in the long-term plan, that work has to be ongoing. That $75,000 predated any crisis that we're dealing with tonight on this call, and in fact is part of the long-term planning. We need to do this as a town, and I believe that um, it is still only one of many steps that we must take. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. The third question comes from a gentleman who's on the call this evening and I'm gonna address two parts of the question. He would like to know from the town of Dover government who profited from selling Dover water to Colonial Water. Um, that would be the seller, a private party, and it was not, it did, that transaction did not have anything to do with the town of Dover. The, um, uh, the, the question also, then would ask, ask, is asking for clarification from the town of, of Dover in terms of profit and what the profit and profitability was of the sale of Dover water to Colonial Water. Um, the answer to that question is, I don't know. I don't know if Chris knows, and I don't know if we were, if we had, if we were told what that was because it preceded my time. Um, and the the answer from my perspective is I don't know what the profitability was as the case where colonial water selling to Aquina or um, uh, the, whatever the subsidiary is, we are not a party to that either. That's a private party transaction and it is not under the purview of the town of Dover. Uh, Chris, did I miss any of that? Is is that consistent with your understanding, um, Bob and Robin? If it, is that also consistent with your understanding? So, so John, I think there's a misunderstanding in general by some citizens of the town that the town controls colonial or controls the water, and we really don't. And I think we had the same issue when we were talking about E. coli. So it's important for citizens to understand that. Colonial is a private water company that services, I think, approximately a third of the residents of Dover. And, you know, the town really is not involved at all in the business. I don't know what happened to John. Oh, there he is. You're on mute. You're still on mute. Thank you, Rob. I, I don't know how that happened, but Bob, would you like to add, add to that? No, I think you guys have covered it. Um, well, I'm okay. Okay. So the next question specifically uh, is has several parts, but it's specific to, I think, most of the things that have been asked and answered with regards to the discoloration, the... Um, specifically some of the levels that have been found, iron, manganese, um, the, 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 the color of the water being a moderate yellow. Uh, the, the specific question, I believe for colonial water, um, do, were you and have you been notified that there was an error on the colonial water website, specifically as it relates to data that was collected incorrectly stating August or September rather 29th to uh, 2021. So either Bob or Nick, could you specifically address items on your website with regards to the chart that is labeled or that you have labeled the properties found in the water with a sample that was collected on 4-30-2019 through the spring of this year, 4-30-2021. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm didn't quite, I, I heard September of 2021, 
uh, which may yeah. have been, which may have been just a misprint. Um, to be honest with okay. you, uh, um, but as far as um, you know, the table that you know, I think the question is the table of it may have been the table of manganese levels. I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, yes, but, it is iron, iron and manganese. Yeah, yeah. Well, iron isn't hasn't really been an issue, but just to uh, I guess address the manganese issue. Um, you know, all through last year, uh, you know, through the boil water, uh, you know, since we had gotten the four log system up and running, uh, the manganese levels were uh, were were fairly low. I mean, uh, you know, they were down. You know, just to you know, put some numbers to it. You know, the you know, although it's a secondary contaminant, uh, you know, 0.05 milligrams per liter is is uh is what they suggest as being a maximum we were at 0.02 uh, but what we saw over the past few months and i guess uh i believe it was probably around may the time i uh you know was i believe the last sample before this discoloration really started uh, was that there was a dramatic increase in the manganese uh you know a tenfold increase as a matter of fact um, which we believe is is contributing to the discoloration discoloration issue, um, you know. So that that's you know that that's the you know the gist of that table that that explains the, the manganese levels. Of it. it it does say, you know, suggests that over the past couple of months they have gone up uh, dramatically. So and, and it, it seems to have coincided with uh, with the dis discoloration. So. Um, you know, so, so that, you know, that is, uh, I guess the intent of that table is to show that. Um, okay. And, and, and well, could, could I just, uh, it's a misprint on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Nick just confirmed it was a misprint. No, no, no I, I haven't. It, um, John, it, the misprint is on the table specifically. I'm, I'm jumping on the website now to, uh, verify. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. I just, uh, you know, just as an, just as just to address something that Mr. Springer had said um, earlier uh, about um, you know the wet weather compared to last year's drought, uh, you know regardless of what the groundwater levels are in the wells, um, our system only has the capacity to pump so much. Um, so it's not just going to flood the system which with whatever amount of water it needs. Uh, you know, they have maximum pumping rates. Um, so regardless of what level the groundwater is at, uh, it can only push a certain amount of water through the system. So when there is a lot of demand, um, you will see uh, pressure drops and, um, you know, and, and he had mentioned irrigation. Uh, well, to give you an idea uh, of, of the level of water use, um, even though this has been a, you know, a relatively wet year, um, you know, typically through winter months when we're not irrigating, uh, we would see, you know, a daily demand or production at the Francis Street stations, you know, maybe around 85,000 gallons per day. Uh, recently and several times throughout this, this summer, uh, we've seen one and a half times that amount by 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so there is certainly... Uh, there is certainly some demand caused by irrigation, uh, you know, on the system. Uh, so again, um, you know, we are seeing incredible amounts of water used, you know, by 10 o'clock, which we would normally see less than in an entire day uh, through the winter months. Um, so just to recap, it's not necessarily due to the groundwater levels. Our pumps only have a certain capacity. Uh, it's really has to do with what, what the what the customers are calling for in demand. Okay, there's um there's a question in the chat that just popped up and it's associated to with this question, Bob. Um, it happens to be a coming from a woman who lives about 200 yards from where the woman who, who wrote the who wrote that question about the manganese and the iron on Church Street. Um, did just, it's just a coincidentally, I live about 300 yards, 400 yards from, from this woman's house who, who wrote the question about the iron and the manganese and the discoloration. The woman on the chart lives about another 
300 or so, 400 yards away, which in Dover, I know some of you listening, this may be, may sound shocking, but it is quite literally could be your next door neighbor. But um, our water is not discolored. We'd have no discoloration and we've had no issues with the water level. The woman on the chat wrote in her main concern is the water level. Why is it, Bob, that people on the same line in the same neighborhood, relatively speaking, I've had no issues, but yet the woman who writes the question about the iron and manganese has had discoloration. Uh, the, the woman who's on the chat is essentially in the same neighborhood and her issue is the lack of water level or the, the, the lack of water pressure. Okay, well, pressure, you know, if you're on the same roadway, I mean, your pressure should really, your, your pressure between uh, properties shouldn't really vary all that much. Um, you know, that's, that's just, you know, uh, I guess I would say kind of a fact. If you're, if you're 300 yards away and you have the same pressure in your line, you know, you have a pressurized main at, at, the, at the curb where it goes into the house, you should have, you know, fairly consistent pressure. Um, as far as discoloration goes, um, you know that's you know that's a, that's a good question that you know I don't I don't know if I have the answer to it. If one person has crystal clear water and their neighbor three hundred yards away has discoloration, um, that may you know have something to do with you know maybe plumbing going to the house, uh, whether they're using their hot water heater, uh, is there filtration in the house already? Uh, there could be several factors. Um, you know, sometimes if there's, you know, if, if there is some sort of sediment moving through the system, it could be a slug sediment, you know, just a kind of a small, discrete um, amount of it moving through the system uh, that might get sucked up by one uh, property and, you know, and not another, you know, depending on when the water is being used. Uh, so, um, you know, and the pressure could vary throughout the day, too. Uh, is, is, you know, going to the pressure issue, you know, um, as I discussed earlier, um, depending on the time of day that you use, you know, uh, for instance, again, I'm going to, I'm going to rely on the high use times this summer where we, you know, experienced, you know, one and a quarter times, you know, the, the daily use uh, by 10 o'clock. Um, during some of those periods, we've had significant drops in pressures that set off alarms at the stations because of the amount of water that's being used. Um, so depending on the time of day that someone is trying to use that water, um, they could experience pressure fluctuations. So whether, you know, whether your neighbor 300 yards away, I mean, I would, I would venture to, to guess that if they turn on their water at the same time, they're going to have the same pressure. You know, uh, it, it, they may be using it at different times of the day. That could, that could be a possibility as well. Got it. Thank you. Um, questions, uh, another question with regards to, you, you just made a, a comment to this, the, the capacity and the, um, the, the, or therefore the lack of capacity to, to properly service some of the, the, the corrective measures that need to be, that need, need to be taken. We have, housing issues where we're addressing um, cluster zoning, we're addressing uh, multifamily houses and Colonial Water has stated in the past that it has capacity to uh, support multifamily homes. That seems to be completely contrary to what we have been discussing this evening, that you don't have the capacity to properly address multifamily homes that are potentially going to be built could could either bob you or nick address that well i think it, i think it's more of a more of a capacity to provide the pressures needed um you know because that does seem to be you know the problem is you know with high use that our pressures do drop um, but as far as capacity to serve additional customers you know, I, th I think that's probably going to be, you know, come out of this study uh, that we're going to have done because um, it is going to assess, you know, the capacity versus availability of the system. Um, so as far as, you know, future multifamily uh, complexes, um, there may have been, I think, I, I know there was, there was one uh, development that I think has been in consideration for several years. Uh, 
you know, uh, and I don't recall, um, you know, before my time here, but I, I know there's, there's been at least one out there that's been under consideration for several years where um, maybe at that time it was stated there, there could be capacity to serve it. Um, but I, of course we've had, you know, we've had several issues in, you know, recently uh, with pressure you know, related to overuse. So, you know, whether I can make that statement, um, what, if there is absolute capacity to provide that, um, that would probably require more study. Yeah, th there's been meaningful discussion, Bob, that you've been a part of, Nick's been a part of, I've been a part of with, with members of the town with regards to the over pumping, we, you just talked, you alluded to it. Um, there's been a conversation that we've all been a part of with regards to homes in Dover that were built 15 or 20 years ago, we're averaging 20, uh, we're averaging 2,500 square feet or 3,000 square feet and 4,000 square feet was a large home. Nowadays, we, we, it is not uncommon for a, a resident in Dover to be building a 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 square foot home. So homes are bigger. We're utilizing a lot more water. And so I would really like to see that to be part of your study. Bob, I, I'd like for you to address how, as homes get larger, where you know, more bedrooms, more whatever, more, more utilization of resources, that this is something that we are you know, acutely concerned with, that we, we need to be prepared and we need to be able to address if a homeowner wants to build a 10,000 square foot home versus a 2,500 square foot home, what's the impact going to be on our resources? So that, that's something that this Board of Selectmen have been dealing with for many years. It's been a goal. It's a goal of ours. It's a goal of our open space, water resources, and the client filler report, it, you know, many of the things that have been mentioned by us and by Denise and the DEP this evening. So I would really like you to, to put that into the consultant's report uh, to come back to us in some meaningful way. I'm going to move on to another question, specifically, uh, Nick and Bob, this is for you. It's from a Powder House Road resident. Um, she would like to know if Colonial Water be encouraged to reimburse affected customers for their expenses purchasing drinking water during this prolonged and unfortunate episode. Is that... I'm sorry, John, but it was, is that a comment or a question? It sounded it sound like it was a comment to it, encourage us to so. um, It is a question. I, I apologize if I didn't um, read it appropriately, but she's asking specifically, uh, will you be reimbursing customers for drinking water that they've purchased? I know this is something that we did last year in the E. coli. You, I believe, Nick, you addressed part of that where you said it's not it is not presently something you are considering with the bottled water, but this is a this is going a next step further of reimbursing people for their purchase of bottled water. Yeah, I, uh, John, I think I'm gonna answer that question the same manner that I answered uh, Chris's question, and and that you know I think that we have an opportunity to evaluate what the resources can be. Uh, that the that the company could provide, um, you know, a reimbursement of purchases uh, certainly would be uh, a consideration that uh, I think that we need to collectively meet here as a group and be able to report back to uh, or through Chris to the town uh, specifically where we fall on what the resources may be and what we can commit to. Um, so let me let me uh, let me leave it where we'll have that discussion, and I'll be back to Chris in short time on this. Okay, thank you, Kate. I have exhausted the questions that you gave me earlier. I I know you've been monitoring some of the chat questions. I know you had uh, one or two questions that came in after you had sent this over to me. Is there anything that you would like to add? Are there any questions that you've you've received that we haven't haven't addressed substantively this evening? Uh, I do not believe so. Okay, thank you. So before well, I, I'm gonna 
ask Denise for a final comment and I'm gonna ask Robin and Bob for a final comment, um, the members of the DEP for a final comment before we wrap this segment up this evening. I just wanna say- I'm a member to of your audience, that, can you hear me? John, I'm a member of your audience, Chris Wolf. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Thank you. We live at 22 Francis Street. I put in the chat a question about the financial viability of the Dover Water Company, given this unforeseen expense. Could we ask those representing them here today to speak to their viability? And what will it take for us as a community to keep them afloat and make sure that they can deliver safe water to us? Bob, uh, Bob Gallo. Yeah, I can I can answer that one. Um, that, that's actually a really good question. Um, so, I mean, the 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 Colonial Water Company itself is is financially uh, stable. Um, you may or may not be aware of this, but uh, typically uh, the company runs uh, uh, pretty thin from a from a from a from a profitability standpoint through pretty much uh, the first five to six months of the year. And then, um, and then once we come into season um, and increased demands, uh, that's when um, typically we kind of return, we turn that corner uh, and we ride out the rest of the year uh, with that corner. So um, from, a, from a financial standpoint, the company is stable. Um, it's not something that um, anybody needs to be worried about that uh, we would not be uh, a viable company. Um, however, I preface that with um, you know, last year's, last year's, um, last year's, you know, outcomes, last year's scenario relative to the E. coli was a, was a pretty significant hit, um, on the company in which, uh, it required the company to perform a financing, uh, in other words, to, uh, to take out, uh, some long-term debt, um, in which we've done and, uh, you know, we're, we're repaying back those, those, uh, debts that we've, we've taken out, um, you know, from the standpoint of having the, 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 the cash flow necessary to address this issue, um, we are uh, able to do so. We're in a position to be able to do so. Um, and I think speaking um, bigger picture here in the proposed transaction that, um, um, you know, we've discussed previously, which would be from Aquarian Water Company uh, purchasing uh, Colonial Water Company in its purchase of New England Service Company. Um, that just goes to speak again to additional resources. Um, you know, if that transaction is to be effectuated, that would be available to all of Colonial Water Company customers as well as um, the remaining subsidiaries of New England Service Company. Thank you. I don't know, Kate, if you can see in the chat, that it, just to identify the, I, I again would ask if, if there is a question, use the hand raise function on the Zoom or use the chat feature. Uh, it's, it's virtually impossible for me to see everyone to be able to moderate all of the questions that, that may or may not be being asked simultaneously. Um, I'm gonna move to just final comments and first ask, Representative Denise Garlick, just for a final comment. So thank you very much, John. And, and thank you to everyone who participated tonight. I did read a comment in the chat that um, a member of the Dover community appreciated that the respect that was being shown in this conversation. But, um, I, and I think that is of utmost importance, but do not let that measured tone um, disguise the passion that the town of Dover, the select board, um, and certainly the legislative delegation have around this issue. And when you review your notes, you will see that we have gotten very important information tonight. And more than that, we have information that is on the record. Um, I just want to continually restate my steadfast commitment on this issue of water quality in Dover to the town, as well as to the colonial water customers. Um, promise to engage in continued robust communication with DEP and thank the DEP staff for being as responsive as they have been. Um, and to say that overall what we need and what we are all trying to do here beyond the long-term plan for water quality in Dover, 
but right now immediately is to ensure safe drinking water, um, appreciate the primary contaminants. We're not seeing them there, but we must all recognize the extreme tension and anguish that is being caused to the Colonial Water Company customers in water that is discolored, feels unsafe, certainly, and for which we are still striving to have a solution. Denise, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your passion and, and, and your advocacy on our behalf. Kristen, Eric from DEP, last comments from you? Yeah, no, I just, I'd like to thank you guys for pulling the forum together tonight. Um, I think it's really helpful to be able to share information in real time with everyone so they know what's going on, so there's no misunderstanding. Um, and we very much look forward to con the continued collaboration with the town, uh, the legislative delegation, and Colonial Water Company to hopefully resolve this issue as quickly as possible. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for your participation this evening. Kristen, any, any last comments? No, thank you very much. I, I just want to assure um, everyone here that we are at DEP working very closely with Colonial Water Company um, to, to make sure that they are taking steps in an expedited fashion. And, um, you know, I think, as Eric said, we're all looking for the same solution here. So hopefully that will happen as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Robin? So I just like to thank everybody for attending this meeting and I hope at a minimum the citizens of Dover have the feeling and the knowledge that, you know, the situation is being looked at, that the drinking water is safe. It may not look good, but it is safe and that there is a solution being worked on to correct it. Thank you, Robin. Bob? Oh, I think I'm going to be a little bit less upbeat. Um, when I'm listening to the conversation tonight, uh, looking at the chat line, um, I, I don't think there's a way to understate the frustration with residents and Colonial Water Company. Um, quite frankly, it takes way too much effort on the part of too many people to get Colonial Water to be responsive and to act expeditiously. Um, communication has been weak. Um, it requires constant prompting from either, either the board or the TA or represent, our state representatives. I can't imagine any retail company um, surviving very long with sort of the customer dissatisfaction that I saw dis displayed today, discussed today and in writing today and I've heard in the past. So um, yes, um, I think uh, we need to I agree with Denise, as I often do. Um, we need to focus mostly on uh, making expedition, doing, correcting the situations expeditiously, communicating on a daily basis, um, and keeping everyone in the loop. And, 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 and uh, without that, um, I think you just fall back into the uh, to this, this sort of live with the reputation um, of being less than responsive. Um, however, I do understand you guys at Colonial are limited. It's a small company, um, and that needs to be taken into consideration. And um, once prompted, um, in a couple of different free times, uh, working with our town, working with our representation and, and uh, working with the DEP, ultimately gets the right thing done in the right way. So for that, I look forward to having this thing solved. But um, to me, it just takes too much effort. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Just gonna end this segment and this item in our agenda this evening by thanking everyone. Most importantly, thanks to our residents for your patience. I, you've heard from Bob, you've heard from Robin and I, we, we hear you. Uh, Kate O'Brien, our assistant town administrator is taking notes on all of the chat items, questions. There are questions we may not have answered to your satisfaction. If that is the case, please let us know. 
We will continue to ask for answers, advocate on your behalf, and come to a solution to this, just like we have every other issue that's been brought in, in, uh, in front of us. So on behalf of the Board of Selectmen, thank you for your patience. We will address all of these items. We will be reporting back. Uh, we're gonna move on to our next item this evening. I'm gonna thank everyone again, Denise, Senator Raj, the DEP, Colonial Water, all the citizens, and, and pledge to everyone on the call that we will come to a satisfactory solution for the residents of the town of Dover. So thank you everyone for your participation. We're gonna move on to the next agenda item. So Chris, this is your item, if you would be so kind. Uh, I will actually kick it over um, to attorney uh, Honowell, hopefully I pronounced your last name correctly, sir, yes. uh, to give the board a, an overview of the, this conservation restriction. Thank you, Chris. Um, th this will be brief and I can also introduce um, uh, my client, the property owner, who's more central here than I am, um, Mr. Gilmana of 21 Spitz Street. Um, uh, it, I think there are really only two parts of this that might be helpful for the board and for other meeting participants, which is to describe the property. This is a, con a proposed conservation restriction that would apply to 21 Smith Street. And I think I've probably might be best to ask Mr. Mena to describe, to, he, can, he can give sort of an overview of the property in its, um, was where it is in relation to other conservation properties um, and to the Charles River, um, and a little bit of an overview of the respects in which um, he proposes to restrict it um, through a grant in favor of the Doverland Conservation Trust and then I can just give a very quick overview of where we stand procedurally with regard to the approval of the restriction. Um, uh, and then that'll lead up to the, 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 the specific requests that we have of the board. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Mena. Thank you very much, Tom. And it's um, a pleasure to be with, uh, with you all. And thank you uh, for the selectmen for taking this up on your agenda on August 19th. Um, I don't know whether there's a map or not <laughs> We can show um, of the um, property. It's located on the Charles River off at of Smith Street at 21. Uh, is that possible? If not, I can describe it. Okay, great. Kate has it up, I think. So uh, as Kate's putting this map up, there we go. Um, you'll note that uh, uh, down at the bottom of uh, your screen, you'll see Smith Street um, and the Charles Rivers at the top of your screen. Um, the L-shaped area that's in the upper right corner is in fact Porter Woodlands and uh, the Doverland Conservation Trust uh, uh, recently acquired Porter Woodlands in that conservation area. So it's logical to extend that. Although this uh, restriction does not allow public access, we certainly allow a mounted equestrian use and there's signs um, to permit mounted equestrian use through the property. Um, the primary objective of the conservation restriction is to focus on the bucolic nature of this property and particularly its proximity to, um, uh, to the surrounding area, which is just wonderful. And, um, and in that regard, we are limiting the development of developable lots on this property uh, in perpetuity. Uh, our house is situated in the front, uh, in the center of the um, inner um, uh, bounded, bounded area there, you'll see the garage uh, is separated from the house. Around that area and the dashed line is the excluded property. And this property is approximately 20 uh, acres um, of land. And in the front towards the Charles River, you'll see a shaded area or at least a dashed area that is referred to as um, a conservation area B. Uh, the restriction does allow us to, or the uh, subsequent owners to 
uh, engage in farming and equestrian use in um, that area and to allow uh, some fencing, um, see-through fencing in uh, the area that's uh, towards the Charles River uh, called Area A in connection with that, but no building, no uh, no ability to put a, a riding rink or anything like that. So the the area in the very front, Area A, is really primarily there to continue to focus on the bucolic nature of the Charles River for uh, people that are um, at adjacent properties coming in from Sherburne or for that matter, even canoeing along the river. In the, uh, the other shaded areas, the areas to the left and to the right of the of the um, excluded property, which is our retained uh, non-restricted property, is C1 and C2, which are identical in, in all respects. I won't get into the nuanced differences. Those are really there for bucolic purposes. In fact, in the area to the left of your screen, C2, there is an intermittent stream that runs through the property and out to the Charles River. Um, and that's the uh, extent of the conservation restriction, and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Mena. This is a beautiful property. It, it's, um, there, there happens to be a very well-defined trail that runs through your property um, to the property on the other side of Smith Street for, for riding never for mountain biking or, or anything of that nature. But uh, I, I don't know how anybody who would ever own a mountain bike would ever want to ride along that trail. But there have been a great deal of people who, who've mentioned what a spectacular property this is and what a generous um, use of the property that this will be. Just a quick question, sir. There's you know, there is a very well-established path. And you, you said there isn't, um, there isn't pedestrian access, but it seems like it's used all the time by pedestrians to cut over to the other side of Smith Street and to um, property, your, your budding property along the Charles. Um, why, why is that the case? Why, why horses, but no pedestrian traffic? So um, the, the, Norfolk Hunt Club has ride, ridden through this area for years. And um, in fact, uh, our neighbor, um, uh, as we faced the Charles River to our left was Greg Sullivan. Many of you know Greg Sullivan, but he moved uh, and now we have new neighbors. And then beyond Greg is Sierra Bright. Uh, neither Greg nor Sierra permit uh, public access through their property on that trail. They do allow for on a permitted basis for the Norfolk Hunt Club to go through there. So in fact, even if we were to, we well, I have no, we, we're not doing this, but if we were to allow public access, it would just stop at the border technically of our property and the next adjacent property. So there really is no way uh, for uh, there to be a continuous loop uh, in any respect um, beyond our home. We have decided that we personally uh, wanted to help those folks and the Norfolk Hunt Club and those that support equestrian use to be able to allow mounted equestrian use. Given uh, the property's proximity to Port of Woodlands and, and in the middle of COVID, I know many of you experienced the same thing. We were overrun with people. We have had people uh, come park at the bridge uh, canoe launch area, uh, wander down the Port of Woodlands area, pitch tents and um, fish uh, sitting on our property with lounge chairs. So, so we just are worried about being overrun um, uh, in that regard. And for that reason, we didn't want to allow for public access. Um, and uh, lastly, I would just add that I think that the, the bucolic nature of the property and the lack of development is in and of itself a, 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 a great thing to have accomplished here without necessarily uh, ending up in a situation where this very private residence uh, ends up having people um, overrun it. The Porter Woodlands has trails. I'm a member of the Dover Land Conservation Trust uh, and also the TTOR. And um, I actually personally labor to, to keep those trails open. So there's lots of ability for people to use trails adjacent to this uh, private residence, which is 
um, which is just across uh, across the way, across the field. Is that responsive, uh, Mr. Jeffries? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, Robin, anything you'd like to add? No. Bob? Well, I'd like to say thank you, um, for sure. Uh, it's just a terrific thing. And, and uh, somehow I'm going to have to find my way over to Smith Street to find out and take a harder look at this area because it just sounds wonderful. But uh, thank you for this consideration. I, I, it just adds to really the, the history of what Dover is and the specialness of Dover and the respect for our natural resources. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I might just um, conclude this with uh, a description of where we are. So the, the restriction has been um, finalized. I think Tom uh, might have been frozen there, but I can fill in for him while we wait for him to return. Mm -hmm. uh, he might be disconnected. Anyway, we're at the point where uh, all of the approvals have been obtained. Um, oh, here is Tom. Tom's back with us. There you go. You're on mute, Tom. Yeah, I think I'm back, sir. I, I, I must have lost the connection. Um, the grantor, grantee, and the town through its um, uh, town council have finalized the language of the actual restriction, including the exhibit that we just reviewed. Um, we have presented this in a bit more detail to the Dover concert. Tom froze again. Um, That's fine. I, I can have to fall, fill, fill in. I can, I can just fill you in and just say that the Commonwealth has, has signed off on this, as has the grant, the, the grantee, Dover Land Conservation Trust, of course. Um, we've gone through all of the steps. The Commonwealth doesn't uh, execute the CR until it, all of the other approvals have taken place. Obviously, we went through Conservation Commission, too, uh, with uh, Attorney Barger and others present. So um, I think that that was the point that, that Tom wanted you to be aware of, that the Commonwealth have yet to sign off, but they have told us that they are finished commenting on the CR and are just simply waiting for everyone else's signatures and then they will in fact sign it and accept it. Terrific, thank you. If there is no other comment or questions from anyone on the board or, or, or anybody uh, within Chris's office, I would move to approve the conservation restriction at 21 Smith Street as it has been received and ask for a second. I'll second. All in favor, aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springer. Thank you again, Gil. Thank you. Thank you. Gil, thank you very, very much. Just a spectacular Thank you very much. It's really. And Thank you. Appreciate the time. Take care. Good night. Item number three, authorization for self-funded community center building project. Uh, rather self-explanatory to everyone who's read this. This is the way the projects are done. There's really nothing to add to, to this from an overview, simply to say that from an accounting standpoint, the town has to set up a dedicated fund to draw the money out of to pay specific bills, uh, simply an accounting transaction and something that from a due diligence standpoint, compliance standpoint that the town uh, should do. And um, it is a best practice from our financial advisors. So I just ask that Bob or Robin, would you like to make a comment before we move this along? No, I, I think it's self-explanatory. Yeah, I agree, but it's um, only self-explanatory for people who've actually read the documentation. So isn't part of this, John, because, because we have to set aside money that the bond issue that people voted at town meeting is ultimately going to fund? 
And so it's sort of a, it's sort of a way to pay current bills with with money. Um, so, so that it's not a, would not be normally available until we actually uh, raise the bond. Did I get that right? Right. right so until you float float the bond, you you issue bans. They're temporary bonds, which allow you, based upon town meeting approval, to commence with the project. And pay bills, right? That's and pay the bills pay. associated yeah. with the project. That's it for me, John. Yeah. Thank you. Right, but I don't, there's there's no action that we need to take. So it's informational, correct. I guess. Correct. Is that, that is correct, right, Chris? We Do we have to, oh, we have to move? Fun. Nope, nope. I uh, I need a vote from the board, and then you need to sign the documents so we can submit them to the DOR. There is a, there is a motion. We have to move. We have to move the authorization. I I move to authorize the authorization of a self-funded community center building project. And ask for a second. Second. So is that the motion? Well, well the motion different. here says I move to advance funds in lieu of borrowing to pay for the owner's project manager and architectural costs for the community center building project. Is that what you need, Chris? Yep. Sounds so, like Robin made the motion. Can we get a second off of that? I'll second it, even though I'm third in, in the queue. <laughs> all, all, all in favor, I, John Jeffries. I, Robin Hunter. I, Bob Springett. Thank you. I was in. John, no need to yes, apologize. Then, uh, I I skipped over the motion and went to the memo behind it. So we're we're we are all uh, here for one another. So thank you. God, what would I Just do? remind you, John? That's called teamwork. Right. <laughs> I mean, I felt a little stupid because I'm thinking to myself, I'm sure we should be making a motion, but there isn't one here. That's because I was past the motion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Approve of the final mortgagee acceptance. Item number four, approval of the final mortgagee acceptance related to the acceptance of Stagecoach Lane as a public way. So background for this. Um, as you may all recall, this was an item for, on town meeting. All the mortgage holders have to report back uh, their acceptance of Stagecoach. Um, there was one outstanding mortgagee that did not meet the timeline. We, uh, we amended the motion at town meeting to allow this to happen at town meeting with the acceptance of this in the future. So, oh, I believe uh, that is, in essence, the appropriate language. Uh, Chris, is there anything to add to that in terms of the overview of how we're still dealing with Stagecoach Lane? So this is just the final town process. meeting. Yep, this is just the final process to finalize the town's taking uh, of the street or the acceptance of the street. Um, so. Jillian's with us this evening. I, I've seen that she's been on since around 6.30 with us. So I'll give her a second to provide any comments uh, to the board on, on this matter that she worked on for us. Sure, thanks everybody. Um, so tonight we actually need the uh, board to formally issue the order of taking for the way and to accept the deeds for the individual parcels. Um, thank you for the helpful summary of what happened at town meeting. The issue was that pending that final acceptance, we couldn't take these final steps. Um, but now that we do have that final mortgagee acceptance in place, we're able to go ahead, issue the order of taking and accept the deeds, um, get these to record and be done with the process. Thank so you. There's a motion for the board um, right. that has so been reviewed and supplied by council. Again, and I apologize, Jillian, I, I'm <laughs> there. I don't know how th I have got four different PDFs for the agenda items. I, can, I can take care of it for you, John. I, I will make the motion. I move to approve the deeds and related documents to accept stage co coach lane as a public way. Public way. Second. All in favor, aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Hi, Bob Springer. 
Thank you very much. I hope I got it right, Jillian. Is that it? I, that's okay. all set for the deeds. Um, if you could also uh, move to issue the order of taking to uh, take the interest in the real estate as well. Is there a separate motion for that? There should be. It's just a, it's a two piece process for the taking and for accepting of the deeds. So one of the documents in front of you. We didn't get, we didn't get a, a second motion. Um, so perhaps if we can just provide, if you can provide the board language on the order right now. So, so maybe we should just, I move to approve the order of deeds. The order, order of taking. Order of taking to accept stage coach lane as a public way. Okay. Second. All in favor, I John Jeffries. I Robin Hunter. I Bob Swain. Yeah, the the order of taking was included in our package, so we have that. Sorry, I, I'm again. I, I. It it was a little bit confusing, John. No. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Oh, we do that too. Item, uh, Jillian. Thank you. I think that concludes everything with Stagecoach. Thank you, everybody. Should we get a confirmation? She waits, so we're good. <laughs> all right, we're all set. Thank Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, Jillian. Item five, appoint Kate Ryan as the American with Disabilities Act coordinator. Congratulations, Kate. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So tonight I'm asking the board to appoint me as the ADA coordinator for the town of Dover. So once uh, this happens, um, I'll basically be the contact for individuals who need um, auxiliary aids for effective communications and programs and services for the town. Um, once appointed, uh, my contact information, the ADA grievance procedure and notice of non-discrimination will be publicly displayed um, in the town building and on our website. So all this supporting documentation will uh, allow the town to apply for a planning grant um, from the Massachusetts Office on Disability. And this is something that our land use coordinator, uh, Courtney Starling, is, is working on. Terrific. Well, thank you. I'll just be very brief and read the summary. Title II of the ADA requires all state or local government entities with 50 or more employees to appoint a responsible person to coordinate and oversee the administration requirements of the ADA compliance. That's why we, we're not nominating you, John, a responsible person. <laughs> 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 I complimented you. I couldn't you. help myself. I could no. not help myself. Three times in a row, complimenting you. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. I moved to the point, Assistant Town Administrator, as the Americans with Disabilities Act ADA Coordinator. Second. S and ask for a second. Second. All in favor? Aye, John Jeffries. I, Robin Hunter. I, Bob Springett. Kate, thank you. Congratulations. Very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six, Police Chief McGowan, Fire Chief Lutazi, requesting approval of the Board of Selectmen to dispose of miscellaneous items which are no longer in the service and are required and are incompatible with current equipment. Items include hoses, venting fans, light bars, lights, mounting racks for lights, sirens, strobe lights, all in order to dispose of town owned property. Items must be declared surplus by the Board of Selectmen. And I know that you are secretly asking 
is Bob Springett going to take these disposed items and mount them on his car? Well, John, I was thinking, aren't you the one with the <laughs> old ambulance? I mean, a siren, a lights. And anyway, John, I didn't see anything useful on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so neither Bob Springett or John Jeffries will have lights on their, on their boats, on their launch, on, on their whaler, or their slightly used emergency response vehicles that happen to be used for dog days. I promise. Um, seeing no discussion, no further discussion, I move to deem the specified items as surplus items. I'll second that. All in favor, aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, Bob Springett. Thank you very much. I wonder if we can actually get a photo of some of these things going away so no one can claim that. You know, I put them on any vehicles that I own or Dave Sullivan might have a car down in the Cape that looks somewhat like a police cruiser. We're kidding, Dave. We know you don't have one. Item seven, board members will provide updates. Uh, I do not have an open space update and we, we do not have, um, we did, I, I, I will say one thing that there was a conversation at open space with regards to Snow Hill. Snow Hill has a tower a ranger station, many of you are familiar with it. There is an, uh, a communication antenna that's attached to the ranger station at the top of Snow Hill. The chief, the two chiefs, aforementioned two chiefs, uh, had asked, had, had reported that the relay signal from that tower was not working properly. In an effort to comply with our need to provide emergency communication, there is a temporary tower that is has been erected at the top of Snow Hill. So uh, that was something we addressed this week and it's just something that I, I am reporting on that the temporary tower at the top of Snow Hill is known to the town uh, through both Chief McGowan and Chief Futazi. Chris, is there anything that you would like to add? Not on Snow Hill, nope, thank you. Robin, Bob, reports. I don't have any updates. Yeah, it's August is kind of a slow month. Carol had a couple of meetings around the site plan um, that seems to be buttoned up and it's just continuing to move on. I think their next meeting is, is before the end of the month. Um, but uh, there's really nothing of substance to report uh, on that one. On um, the only thing I can report is talk about some of the work on the Technology Advisory Board. Um, uh, we reached out to a number of communities to kind of get a sense of what they're doing about some of the things we've talked about during our planning exercise. Um, that should be uh, wrapped up probably next week. And so I think we have a meeting next week, right? Yeah, August 26th. So I might be able to give give a, a more of a coherent uh, recap of what we're finding out uh, where other towns stand relative to us. So helping our understanding of, of uh, where we are and where we need to go, bracket it. That's it. Great, thank you. We will be meeting again August 26th and September 9th, September 23rd. Item eight. Chris, town administrator's report. Yep, thank you, John. Just a couple of quick things for uh, for the board and folks this evening. Um, the first is I wanted to uh, thank the Dover Historical Society uh, for hosting the select board and uh, and myself uh, to a tour of their property uh, on Monday. In particular, uh, Elijah Lee, Kevin Shale, Stuart uh, Swinney, I'm probably mispronouncing his last name. I'm sorry, Stuart. Uh, and Betty Brady, um, who organized uh, the trip and the and the tour of the property, we were able to see the Carroll House and the and the Sawin Museum and the incredible collection 
uh, of, of local historical artifacts uh, in Dover and in the surrounding area. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to them for organizing that. Had a great time um, looking at everything that they've put together and would certainly encourage uh, everybody in town to, to take a look at their properties, go on the tours uh, and check out everything that they have to offer at the uh, at their website, which is uh, doverhistoricalsociety.org. Uh, uh, Claybrook Road, uh, we continue to monitor it, uh, especially with um, high levels of precipitation uh, like we experienced uh, today. Uh, the road uh, in its current state uh, remains in the current state, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and our geotechnical engineers have, uh, have wrapped up uh, their boring investigatory work. Um, so we should have a, a, a better understanding of uh, the roadway and what's underneath the roadway, as well as a, a plan to fix it, um, or at least how we can fix it uh, in the next week or so. So I'll get that together uh, and have our interim highway superintendent uh, join me, uh, join us at one of these upcoming meetings uh, to talk about next steps. Uh, and the last thing I just wanted to uh, highlight for the board, we had talked about this um, uh, some time back, uh, but I wanted to highlight for you uh, and for the public that uh, the, our, our agenda packets, full packets uh, are available online for viewers. Um, so I know that, you know, as we talk about things, sometimes, you know, if we're unable to share our screen or we're in a, a, a session in public in person, it's difficult for, for residents uh, and participants to follow along. Uh, so now the full agenda packet that the board has is available uh, online before meetings for the public, uh, which can be found uh, right now on the uh, agenda center where all the, the meeting agendas and the, um, the meeting minutes are posted. Uh, we'll also provide a link on the calendar uh, on the website, which I know is where a lot of uh, residents just directly go to uh, to look at uh, and join uh, upcoming meetings. So uh, that's all I have for the board this evening. Thanks, Chris. I just want to follow up on two items that that you you both you mentioned. Uh, one is Claybrook Road with respect to last weekend was the pan mass challenge and as many of the residents know dover is literally the second town for the wellesley start with that the the cyclists ride through in addition to the the event going going through dover on the on the first day it also hosts it also has a big uh, impact on the second day which has become a very popular day as well so claybrook road actually was in fact you utilized the second day by several thousand cyclists. So I just want to you give public acknowledgement to the Dover Highway Department for their work, to Bobby and his staff, Bobby Tosi and, and his staff for all the work that they did, ensuring that there was safety and, and that the, everything went off very smoothly for Pan Mass Challenge. Um, also to the Chief, Chief McGowan, he... Uh, personally, as well as members of his staff, come in to monitor the intersections at Springdale, Main Street, um, all along you know, Farm Road. So there, uh, there, there really is a coordinated effort for a great event that raises upwards of $50 million a year for the Dana Farber and for cancer research. So I, I got a thank you note from Billy Starr and Meredith Starr. Um, and I got a thank you note from Jared Collins, who's the CFO at Pin Mass Challenge. So they were very appreciative of everything that Dover does and continues to do in partnering with the Pan Mass Challenge. So just wanted to share that with everyone. John, just one thing. I'd, John, just one thing I'd like to make sure to say. Uh, I also very much appreciated the tour that we got for the Carroll House and the Solomon Museum. Yeah. It really is. Uh, and the people that it, the people are truly dedicated. They're truly professional. Um, they did a superb job. People should take advantage of it. Totally agree. And, and, and Bob, I, I should have, I, I, I shared this with Chris and I was, I was in attendance, stay, uh, saw the first half of, of the tour, had to leave thinking I was coming back because my intent was, I just have to bring my car for somebody to bring one of my children to the airport. Turns out it was me who had to bring <laughs> it. 
minor item that was lost in, in translation, but so I, <laughs> I apologize for not returning to the Samhain portion. And like you, Bob, and probably Robin as well, I had not toured both of the facilities since my kids were at Chickering. And like you, Bob, like we shared, I'd never been upstairs. I'd never been to the second floor because when there's, you know, 30 or 40 second graders or third graders, they just make a big circle through the first floor of the house. It's fascinating. I, I learned so much I, um, just in that, you know, hour and a half that we, we spent. It, it's just echo Bob's comments that it is a treasure. It is an absolute treasure to have those two pieces in the town of Dover. So I really appreciated everything that they did. Right, I was, it was unfortunate that I was unable to attend. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to try do it on my own. Maybe I'll get a private tour someday. Yeah, they're open. You know, they, right. they are, they are open. It's a, it, it's just a great resource. It just is a beautiful, beautiful spot. Going to move to the consent agenda. Um, items are the approval of one day liquor licenses for August 13th, retroactively, 21st, 23rd, 24th, 26th, September 3rd, 5th, and 10th. Approval of October 17th, Powissett Farm Rail Trail Run. Approval of October 3rd, 10th Annual Ride for the Fo Ride for Food Fundraiser. Approval of an open session meeting minutes, June 24th and July 8th. And thank Mona DeCilio for her spectacular meeting minutes. May I hear a, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. May I get a second? Second. All in favor, aye, John Jeffries. Aye, Robin Hunter. Hi, Bob Springer. Hey, thank you all. Good night, have a good weekend. Watch out for that hurricane on Sunday. I think it's yeah. just a tropical storm. Well, it's, it's debatable. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Some of us with things in the water are very concerned. Right, well, I don't know. Um, at, work, at work today, we got tornado warnings. So it's yeah. pretty scary. Yeah, well, it was a pretty well, good system. Yeah, it was a pretty, pretty tough system coming through. Right. Fred, that was Fred. I can... That was Fred. Well, I can tell you from experience that the, the, the most damage I've ever seen were done by storms with no name, specifically the no the name, no -name storm. storm. In <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to go have dinner. Uh, John, <laughs> you all want uh, to as well. I think Chris needs us to do something. Uh, John, John was heading there. Come on, I John. moved to adjourn. May I get a second adjournment? Second. All in favor. I, John Jeffries. I, Robin Hunter. I, Bob Spring. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night.